Good morning, everybody. Sorry, we're getting going a little late um, uh, due to the fire alarm. So uh, exam last night went very well, as you probably already know. Uh, the average is uh, around 75%. Uh, so that's pretty darn good. And um, it's, uh, it's one of those cases also uh, where effectively it's skewed low, so effectively it's even higher than that. Uh, so um, good job, I guess. That's uh, encouraging. I hope you all had a rewarding experience. And of course, today we'll uh, try to get you some more points on the exam. And I suspect the pop quiz tomorrow will go well because it looks like you guys understand uh, what's going on. So we're going to do, uh, we'll wait for people to come in. We'll do a little bit of the, uh, today's material, and then we'll do our uh, bonus question. So we're at the point where we're talking about pretty much everything on the roadmap to Chem 1. Uh, we're going to talk about chemical reactions and uh, specifically today looking very carefully at the individual chemicals to see what's going on, the individual compounds, uh, keeping in mind the thermodynamics and their structure as we go. So lots of stuff uh, to, to uh, learn and overlap today um, because we're gonna look at, we're gonna go back and look at individual bonds now that we know quantum mechanically how they exist. We'll go back uh, and look at them again in terms of uh, enthalpies. Um, this is, uh, oh, this is an old <laughs> animation. Uh, I don't think it's there anymore. <laughs> that is. Uh, can you guess whose car that is? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Can you read the license plate from there? <laughs> That's my car. <laughs> so... Um, Bond association is what we'll talk about today. So uh, the energy of the bonds, and we have said this many, many, many times. If you take nothing else from chem, home from Chem 1, breaking a bond requires energy. There's, that's why they exist. You have to pull them apart. That's going to higher energy. And when I do this, that's me putting energy into the system. If I put energy into the system, pulling it apart, the system goes to higher energy. I'm not the system. I'm the external force pulling it apart. So if I break the bond, I have to put in energy to do that. And that should be a uh, breaking an endothermic process. So here's a bond breaking. We have a molecule XY. And if I break it into X atoms and Y atoms, I expect that to be uphill in energy. And this energy or uh, enthalpy, we'll kind of, we'll let those terms uh, slide and go back and forth uh, a bit, whether this is a, an enthalpy or an energy. Should probably use energy if we use gas phase reactions here, but we're gonna let that kind of uh, uh, slide and be a little cavalier with our, uh, our uh, designation, but this is an energy and it's uh, an absorption of energy. And then when I form the bond, energy is released. So going downhill, we're in a potential well of uh, free energy in this case, where the bond is the more stable interaction between those two. So that's not very surprising. Uh, here are some uh, average bond uh, enthalpies or energies. And this is uh, interesting because, uh, you know, there's uh, billions and billions of kinds of bonds because there's uh, so many, you know, potential combinations mm -hmm. of elements. So on this table, we've just uh, listed some bonds but we're gonna call them average bond enthalpies. 
Uh, some of them are exact. This is exactly the energy of a hydrogen-hydrogen single bond and a chlorine-chlorine single bond because there's only one kind of hydrogen-hydrogen bond and one kind of chlorine-chlorine bond. But when you start to talk about the double bonds of carbon and the single bonds of carbon, those are just the average over many, many compounds that have uh, a single carbon-carbon bond. So when we talked about enthalpies of formation, those were exact numbers. Those are numbers that you can get from an experiment. These uh, average bond enthalpies or average bond energies are compiled from uh, just basically a lot of uh, experimental evidence. So average is here. Some of these are exact because there's only one kind uh, of bond. The nitrogen triple bond there. And you can see something here already that uh, you might recognize. So the bonds were given these, uh, this is the formally the, the enthalpy of breaking the bond. So these are all positive numbers. So if this is the enthalpy of breaking the bond, you see that these bonds are stronger, harder to break. Uh, but there's one, uh, one thing that might bother you about it. You kind of, we, we want the more stable bonds, the ones that are harder to break, we want them to be lower in energy. And if you just look at the numbers, that looks like it's a bigger number. So you have to remember that that's, these are all relative to the atoms and that that's an energy going downhill. So if you were to plot uh, these, you would say, well, here are all the atoms. I'm just going to plot this in. Uh, so here are all the atoms in there. Uh, and these are atoms now. This isn't the elements in their standard state. These are gas phase atoms. And if I take the atoms and I form bonds, so here you would form, for instance, Cl2, and you'd come down 242. Uh, if you form N2, you would come down 946. So this fact that this is a higher number, we have to remember, yeah, it is still farther down in overall energy because it's we're talking about forming these uh, bonds from the atoms. So these two make sense relative to each other. This is the weaker interaction. This is the stronger interaction. And it's farther down on the uh, overall enthalpy scale. So just keep that in mind. It, it, it's a source of minor confusion. This is just you know conventional. If it were me, I would have done it uh, differently. I don't get to control the world, though. <laughs> Fortunately, <laughs> I would be a benevolent uh, ruler. <laughs> but if I did this, I would have had these instead of uh, this is uh, breaking the bond, I would have just made them all formations. And then these would all be negative And it would make sense again. But I don't get to rule the world. Uh, the uh, <laughs> You guys have a chance. Get out there <laughs> and rule the world. Maybe someday one of you guys will change this convention. And instead of uh, doing the bond breaking, the bond formation, and then this ordering would make sense. So uh, one of the things, and, and this, as you know, this gets into um, uh, something that confuses a lot of people. For instance, here are these bond energies, and you get the idea that this might be the energy that's released when I break that bond. That's not correct, as we know. That's the energy of the formation of that bond. And uh, But this comes in to play. Has anybody taken any biochemistry? And you see this adenosine triphosphate. And they tell you when this bond is broken, somehow energy is released. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> so 
many biology textbooks have this picture. And I just roll my eyes. Oh, my God. And I like to call up a biologist and say, no, there is no energy released when you break a bond. It takes energy to break that bond. And, you know, they get annoyed and we <laughs> text back and forth. <laughs> What is going on here? Why is, this, uh, why is there this contradiction? And the contradiction occurs because this, this chemical reaction is not all of it is here. It's the hydrolysis of ATP that is exothermic, not the breaking of that individual bond. The reason this is exothermic is there are other bonds that are formed that are more stable. So overall, energy is released, but this, the way this picture is drawn, is obviously crap. So, but it's in, I just pulled that out of a textbook. It's in uh, textbooks. You can start making a campaign and write to them. I already, I, I'm going to stop writing to the biologist because all I get back is, you know, uh, Kubernetes, angry face, angry face, poop emoji. <laughs> they, they don't care about me anymore. <laughs> you can do it, and you can say no. No, 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 no. Write the complete hydrolysis reaction or something. Don't perpetuate crap. OK, so let's do a chem quiz. So uh, when one mole of carbon, in fact, we've done this one already, and we talked through it. Uh, one mole of carbon solid is atomized, how many moles of carbon-carbon bonds are broken? And you kind of need to know that. If you want to estimate an energy from these average bond energies, you have to count up how many bonds are broken. So you have to kind of go through the mental process. Uh, what, I've driven, what I've written here is a topological map of carbon solid. So this is not exactly how carbon solid looks, but uh, topologically is correct because every carbon is connected to four other carbons. So it has the it has the bond information that we need, even though it doesn't have the all the structural information we need. So bonding wise, it's correct. So uh, we can see maybe a little bit better bonding wise uh, in this kind of thing, and then there'd be a layer of this above and a layer of this below. Uh, the carbons in diamond look more like that. One carbon bonded to four other carbons. So given that, how many uh, moles of bonds are broken if a mole of atoms are released? So let's talk about that among ourselves and see if we can come to a conclusion on that. Get your, uh, get your clickers warmed up. So you can take the bonus quiz here in a few minutes. There are some hints. Oh, thank you. Uh, put the output of the, if you don't mind, put the output of the uh, um, Yeah, that guy up there. OK.
All right. Let's see what you're thinking on that. This is Mark. This is Mark. Hello. This is Mark. Uh, Barbara, yeah, yeah. go ahead, quickly. I'm in the middle of a lecture. Quickly, what do you need? If it's not an emergency, can you call back? Thank you very much. Call back in an hour. Thank you. Bye. Okay, let's see what you're thinking. Oops, I'm sorry, I had the mic on while I was talking to the hospital. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, okay, so two is very popular, and uh, I agree with the twos. And uh, initially, I think that I would have thought four, the first day I walked into Chem 1, uh, you start breaking bonds. But in the solid, as soon as you start uh, breaking a bond, that's releasing you know, more than one carbon. It's, it's, it's freeing up that one and that one. So uh, one way to look at this, and I, I always encourage you to do this, is uh, kind of do it in reverse uh, and see if that helps you make sense. So if you had to build that lattice, you could put a carbon and uh, two bonds to it. And then if you continue to build the lattice and add a carbon and two bonds and a carbon and two bonds, you could build that whole lattice by just adding a carbon and two bonds. So there's two bonds per mole of atoms, two moles of bonds per mole of atoms, if you look at it that way. Often helpful to do things in reverse. So uh, I agree, two is the way to go there. Uh, are we up to our midterm bonus? Yes, we are up to our midterm bonus question. So uh, this one was uh, missed frequently, but it's a good one to, uh, there were a couple that were frequently missed, but you guys did so well, it was hard to find uh, one that was really poor, you did poorly on. So, but this is a good one to talk about among yourselves because I think you guys, it's a learning moment. You can talk to each other and see if we can work through this. So go ahead, I have which emission spectrum of these A through E would correspond to this kind of arrangement of uh, energy levels. So go ahead, uh, work through that, talk through that. If you want, draw some pictures and see if you can come to a conclusion on that. Actually, maybe this is why some of you uh, did it wrong. This is in terms of energy, and uh, this is not. <laughs> so uh, let's just fix it right now so you can answer it. Uh, let's make this axis uh, wavelength instead of frequency. Uh, you can do it in terms of energy, just, re just uh, reverse it. So, sorry about that. I can't believe none of us... <laughs>
Okay, let's uh, go ahead and start the response. It seems like you're ready to uh, respond to that. So go ahead and uh, enter your responses. I got logged out. Is anybody else getting logged out? Yeah. Why? I wonder. Uh, hold on. Uh, I don't know why that is. Um, uh, I don't know what it's doing either. I think there might be two versions. Uh, can you respond now? Can you respond now? How many people can respond? I can't see the responses. Can anybody respond now? Can we respond? Everybody responding? Sorry. Technical difficulties. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why it's coming up twice. There is some kind of, although PowerPoint complained about this earlier. Okay. Uh, has everybody got what they want? All right. Fantastic. Uh, so um, uh, we were looking for uh, answer. Uh, e there, and it's interesting. <laughs> so uh, uh, six experts, at least, uh, all the whole staff did this, and none of us noticed <laughs> that uh, that should have been that the energies were reversed. Um, part of it is we kind of expected uh, the answer, and uh, I'm sure many of you did as well. Um, but the good thing is uh, you'll get this point. And you know maybe we'll just toss this one so you'll get two uh, points on uh, extra points on the exam uh, effectively. But how do you answer it? That's the important part. Uh, the it, you probably would have arrived here anyway because it's the only one that has five transitions. So you would have gravitated to that one, and that's what we did. And when we were answering it and just didn't notice the uh, energy was re re reversed. So just be, uh, just be careful about doing this. Be systematic about seeing how many transitions there are. Start at the highest energy and right from that, how many transitions are possible from four or from the top one. So that's three transitions. And then go to the second highest level. How many from that? Two possible transitions. And then the third is here. And you can see there's potentially a lot of spectral lines you could get from that. And then just go back and say, well, if there's some equal spacings uh, or approximately equal spacings, these are schematic. That one and that one look to be about the same energy. So they'd be either very close in energy or right on top of each other. And then there's a group of three at high energy. And if we're going to plot wavelength, high energy would be low wavelength. So there'd be a group of three. And then there'd be one low energy and one between the lowest and the group of high. So uh, fantastic. Uh, I think everybody uh, talked about that and got the idea. And even if all your trusted experts uh, didn't do a very good job of uh, proofreading, uh, often uh, you guys do better than us. So uh, are we going to do this polymerization? Uh, I don't know how to do it. Uh, Karen, can you come out, uh, if you can hear me, and uh, do this polymeriz polymerization reaction for us? So 
we're going to do a polymerization. We're going to take uh, a bunch of double bonds and make the uh, single bond uh, interaction occur here. So if this occurs and you have, uh, you have your table of uh, bond enthalpies up there, um, it's in your notes, what do you expect this overall reaction would be? And you're going to have, again, the same number of carbons here as here. So is that an endothermic, exothermic, or is it about uh, neutral? Is it a, but doesn't uh, release or absorb much energy at all? Uh, go ahead, talk about that among yourselves, and we'll see if we can get Karen out here to demonstrate what polymerization looks like. I will get some. Up on top, there are some numbers for the double and single bond, but you have them in your uh, notes as well. Okay, that looks like you've all uh, come to a conclusion on that. Uh, let's see what you're thinking on the machine. Oops, sorry. See what you're thinking. Uh, exothermic is more popular. And Karen, uh, maybe Karen's... Uh, uh, can somebody just pop in and see if Karen's there and see if she can come out and do this polymerization for us? Um, uh, so endothermic, I agree with you. And the people who are saying endothermic,
Oh, I could have sworn I turned that on. Uh, sorry, mic is off. Uh, so the overall reaction is I break a mole of double bonds, but I make two moles of single bonds. And so I assign a positive number to this because that's the actual uh, breaking. That's the endothermic part. This is the exothermic part. So assign a negative number to that. And you guys should be able to draw that out. You should be able to say, if I start, if I start here with those uh, with uh, a mole of double bonds, I break them, I go up in energy, and then I make two moles of double bonds that releases some energy. And we're saying that that is the case. And we know that's the case. This number was about 600-ish uh, uh, kilojoules to break a mole of the double bonds. And a mole of the single bonds was around 350 kilojoules. But we multiply that times 2. So we're going to get dropped by 700 here, up by 600, down by 700. So a net uh, exothermic reaction. And Karen can demonstrate a polymerization. This isn't exactly this one, uh, but the polymerization of monomers in uh, we have uh, two phases there. I forget what this even is. Methylene and subcoiled chloride. Okay, so uh, we're gonna uh, polymerize. You see two phases there. Uh, there's two reactants in the if yep two reactants in the uh, the beaker, and I think we're gonna what do you put in a catalyst or something? Do you only have to put a catalyst? You have to mix them. Oh, cool. So all you have to do is mix those together, and they react. So uh, uh, we're going to mix them together. And oh, look at that. At the interface, oh, that's cool. So right at the interface, where they're reacting, we're forming a polymer. And you can suck the polymer out from the interface between those two compounds that are reacting together. So uh, I love that. And in general, you might have seen a video like this before. Uh, polymers are often uh, extruded or um, uh, drawn out of uh, mixtures like this. And you could imagine you know, weaving that in. You could be making polyethylene or polyester or something and weaving those threads into uh, fabric and making uh, uh, your high-tech fabrics that uh, we all now wear all the time. Excellent. Thank you very much, Karen, for that lovely demonstration of polymerization. Um, uh, it's, fun, it's funny. Uh, well, you guys know how uh, old I am. Uh, well, way older than you. Uh, I actually grew up uh, in Michigan, in, and we didn't have high-tech fabrics. <laughs> We didn't <laughs> sound like an old codger now. We didn't, back in my day, we didn't have any um, fancy high-tech fabrics. Uh, but I, I uh, ran on the cross-country team. And in Michigan, we have this other thing that you don't have here called winter. And the, we would get up early in the morning, uh, pitch dark, and have our two-a-day practices morning. And we just have to weigh tons of layers of cotton and wool. And it, if you you had wool, that's great, or silk, that helped. But any cotton that you wore just absorbed all the water, and you just froze after you ran for a while because the sweat just continued to cool you off. Uh, it's amazing the difference between uh, these fabrics that they say wick away moisture and keep you warm. They really, really do uh, make a huge difference. You guys are all spoiled. OK. <laughs> Uh, so let's do this. Here's a chemical reaction. Uh, peroxide decomposing into water and oxygen. And if I give you a little more information here about this reaction, can you determine what the structure of peroxide is? And now you have, you're, you're pretty clever because you've talked about, in general, uh, the Lewis dot structures and what makes sense. But... The, ex the extra information I'm going to give you here is uh, 
I don't have any safety glasses, darn it. Uh, that, the information I'm going to give you is something about the energy of the overall reaction. So here's peroxide. This is a catalyst. So the reaction is not going because the activation energy is too high at room temperature. This lowers the activation energy, but the same enthalpy is released with or without this catalyst. So let's just see if it's, I don't even know how much to put in there. Oh, that's enough, clearly. So there we have water and oxygen being formed. And that reaction looks exothermic. So tell me if that's enough information for you to decide what's going on here. Uh, in fact, I'll just talk, we'll just talk through this one uh, since uh, we're getting uh, late into the show with our fire alarm and our midterm bonus. Uh, so let's just talk through this one. Here are some, oh, we can talk through it here. Uh, HO bonds are equal. Uh, basically, you just do some accounting. Let's, let's try to account for the bonds that are broken and formed. And if you look at all the structures that are possible, you'd say, uh, oh, well, let's break that, uh, break that up. I don't know what that is. I do know what these are. So on this side, I have to form water. That's two HO bonds. And I have to form half a mole of OO bonds. And I say, well, if there were two HO bonds over here, forming those and then breaking and then forming, that would be null energy. Break, then form, no difference. Then I have to say, well, here I have a half a mole of oxygen oxygen bonds. So what is the oxygen-oxygen bond over here? If uh, it's a double bond, like this one or this one, then that has to be endothermic, because I would break one mole of bonds and make half a mole of bonds. So break a whole mole, make half a mole. So that would be definitely endothermic. So if it's a single bond and that we have uh, the single bond is less than half the energy of a double bond, then it would be exothermic. And that is the case. So that is exothermic. So you break uh, a mole of single bonds. You make half a mole of double bonds, but a, uh, the single bond energy is less than half of a double bond energy. So overall, that's exothermic. So you would have to look at your table of the bond enthalpies. In fact, we can just maybe quickly go back to the table of bond enthalpies to remind ourselves of that. Uh, the double bond, so much stronger than the single bond. So making half a mole of these more than compensates for breaking a whole mole of those, OK? So uh, that makes good sense to us. Where did we end up? Mm -hmm. That's hard to see. Oops, where, oops, oh goodness. All right, well, we're right on that. We'll just blow through. Uh, and we've done that. So we've already kind of done it here. We said, I can look at breaking bonds and making bonds. I could imagine any chemical reaction virtually as breaking all the bonds in the reactants and forming all the bonds in the products. So I can use these bond energies to estimate enthalpies. And I did say the estimate there word because that's important. If I do use this method, break bonds and then form bonds to find reaction enthalpies or reaction energies, I have to remember that these are averages, many of them. So it's not the exact reaction enthalpy. It's an estimate of the reaction enthalpy. If I use uh, enthalpies of formation, I get an exact number. So let's just look at it, look at it happening here. I'm going to take the reactants, and I'm going to go towards products eventually. 
There's a lot of different ways to do this. And you know, if I go around in a path, a closed path, I can add all the enthalpies together. So what's another way to get from here to here? Well, another way to get from reactants to products is break all the bonds, make the atoms. And I'll tell you again, differentiating, these are the atoms in the gas phase. That's not elements in their standard states, right? Oxygen in its standard state is oxygen gas. Hydrogen in its, hyd in its standard state is hydrogen gas. These are the atoms. So the actual elements, you break it up into gaseous atoms, and then you just rearrange them to form the products. That's basically what we've been doing in these chem quizzes. So I can add up all the energies of uh, breaking the bonds, all the bonds for the reactants, add up all the energies for uh, making the bonds, and I would assign these positive numbers because that is uh, the endothermic part, these negative numbers because that's the exothermic part, and adding that enthalpy and that enthalpy uh, should give me that enthalpy. So I can say that this pathway, this plus this, has to be equal to this because that's how state functions work. It does not matter how I get from here to here, it's always this enthalpy that's released. So if I go this pathway, that's totally fine. This direct pathway, same enthalpy. So it allows me to show what we've been doing in uh, just intuitively, breaking and making, is uh, thermodynamically legitimate, thermodynamically relevant. Uh, let's go one step further. Let's say, well, we have been doing this in terms of enthalpies of formation. So let's say we start with the elements in their standard state and go to products or, uh, well, some compounds. That would be, this reaction is now the enthalpy of formation of all those compounds. So that's possible as well. And I could break up the elements into their atoms and form the compounds that way as well. So we see a link here in this case between enthalpies of formation and these average bond enthalpies. It, whoops, where'd my, oops, I'm sorry. That animation looks like it appears twice. And then stops. OK, we're going to back to where we started. Let's continue the animation here. We have elements uh, going to compounds, enthalpies of formation. If I have some other group of compounds here, of course, I could form them. But this group of compounds going to that group of compounds is some other chemical reaction. So that's a chemical reaction as well. And I want to know the enthalpy of that reaction. But I know I've done this before. If those are the reactants and those are the products, I know I can take this, and that's an enthalpy of formation of the reactants. That's an enthalpy of formation of the products. And that's what we have done previously. We just said, OK, uh, reactants going to products. I know there are two enthalpies of formation. And this is the exact number. So I can add up all the enthalpies of formation of the products and reactants. I know I'm going to reverse the sign on one of them because it's a, uh, I'm going in the reverse direction, going up to the elements, then down here. So I want to get from here to here, going that way. Two steps gets me there, but I'm going to put the negative sign there because I'm going in the reverse of the enthalpy of formation. And I get our familiar uh, reaction that we've had, or our familiar expression that we've used all the time. Uh, so far to get enthalpies of reaction. So that uh, is still all self-consistent. And we can say now, well, there's two ways to do this. How do those ways uh, uh, interact? I can say uh, enthalpy of the reaction is this. We know if I'm going to form this 
is the enthalpy of formation of those compounds, I could do a replacement there and get the same information, enthalpies of formation of products, enthalpies of formation reactants, and I would put in all the bonds here. And I have the same expression for a enthalpy in either bond energies or enthalpies of formation. This is going to be the exact number, and this is going to be an estimate because of the uh, fact that these are averages. So here are those standard enthalpies of formation, just to remind us. And now we have these two ways to do reactions. We have elements in their standard states. If I'm going to break those into atoms and form compounds, I can do that. Or I can say, give me my table of enthalpies of uh, bond enthalpies, and I'll do it that way. So that probably brings into your mind, why do I have two ways? Which is better? Which is worse? Well, we've already said one is exact and one is an estimate. But one is quick and uh, shorthand because if I have to use enthalpies of formation, then I need to know the enthalpy of formation of every single compound in the universe. But if I'm always working with carbon compounds, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen, all I have to memorize or have a table, I don't have to memorize it, most organic chemists do have this memorized, but if you want to just estimate almost any hydrocarbon reaction, you just have to remember like four or five bond enthalpies because you're always breaking and making the same kinds of bonds. So it's very quick to look at an organic reaction and estimate an enthalpy. And they're pretty close. You'll certainly get the difference between exothermic and endothermic, but you might not get an exact number that you would get from these enthalpies of formation. But say you're making a new compound that no one's ever made, so you can't even go to a table of enthalpies of formation and find it. So you can use this estimate to say, well, I'm breaking these carbon bonds and I'm making these carbon bonds. I can estimate what the enthalpy will be, and I know how much uh, protective gear to wear <laughs> when I'm doing the reaction. We're always wearing the appropriate uh, protective gear. OK, so let's do this one. Uh, hydrocarbon formation. What's the enthalpy of this? And now, I've already broken it down for you. <laughs> so there's some hydrocarbon where you'd break all the hydrocarbon bonds, and you'd form these new carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen bonds. What is the enthalpy for that reaction? Uh, so go ahead and think about that for a minute. Talk about that among yourselves. And we'll put up uh, some, start the quiz, but we can put up some, hmm. We don't have any hints for that. Uh, OK. Uh, go ahead, talk about that one among yourselves. I will find some useful information for you. Yep. Uh, there's some useful information. You have that. Uh, there is some uh, useful information. It's the same useful information. Uh, there's also uh, this. Uh, I'd like to show those both. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm in the booth. Can I have the, uh, you guys can go ahead and talk about it. Uh, can I have the output of here? So uh, there's a standard enthalpy of formation that you just saw. Um, uh, I will put uh, that there. You have this on your phones or on your devices already. So with that on your device, uh, here I could show you uh, this one, and then I'll go back, and up top we'll show you the bond enthalpies in case you need those, and uh, see if you can come to a conclusion on that, uh, talking among yourselves.
OK, so a lot of accounting here. Um, I, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring us together. We can do the accounting together. Uh, you, you get the idea. Uh, this is what we're trying to look at. Uh, these numbers, though, the reason, the reason I was showing you, uh, the reason I was showing you uh, this uh, table, uh, both of the tables, uh, is uh, where's the other table? We'll put it, up, leave it. Oh, 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 there it is. Uh, can I leave that up top? The reason I was showing you uh, the table is uh, uh, one of those numbers. Minus 278 is up there. Uh, oh, but also 394 is up there, too. Oh, they're all up there. Uh, so that actually um, might, might have given you some hint that you could also use this table instead of the bond enthalpy table. But let me just tell you, it's OK to use the bond enthalpy table. That is one way you will do things on the exam. So don't feel like, oh, I should have done it a different way. Uh, but here's one of those things that I kind of like you to recognize. If I'm breaking four carbon carbons, three hydrogen hydrogens, and one half oxygen oxygen, what are these? This is carbon solid. This is hydrogen. If I wrote it like this, What would you call all those things? Elements in their standard states. <laughs> so now you know, if you get that far, you know this is an enthalpy of what? Formation. This whole reaction must be the enthalpy of formation of something. OK? So it's just a learning experience. You didn't have to realize that. That was you know, maybe one step beyond. It wouldn't be beyond me, though, you know, to put that on the exam. I would put it like this. I wouldn't make it that. Uh, I would put H2 and O2, so it's the way you see it more commonly. But if I put it like that, but then put all these bonds, you would have to, if you were going to do it by bonds, you would have to convert it back into this. But you also might realize it's the enthalpy of formation of something. And then if you had an enthalpy of formation table, you could go, well, in whatever it is. Oops, there's a bond missing there, isn't there? Uh, if you had a table, you could say, well, what of those things has one carbon-carbon bond only? <laughs> so that narrows it down. <laughs> and you immediately go, well, I have to have at least two carbons. Uh, uh, in fact, I probably have only. Uh, two. I look up there at the on the top right, and I see that compound there. That's ethanol. And does that make sense? It has one carbon carbon. It has five carbon hydrogens. It has one carbon oxygen and one oxygen hydrogen. So this is the enthalpy of formation of ethanol, kind of disguised a little bit. But as I said, I didn't expect you to realize that. I just put it in here as a, as so we could talk about both of them together. As you know, I will mix them together on the exam. You've probably already seen that in the homework. And I want you to recognize, uh, I don't know, if you take nothing else home from Chem 1, <laughs> take home the fact that enthalpies of formation are the formation of a compound from the elements in their standard state. That's something you have to know. I don't put that back on the exam. So you have to know that number up there, minus 278 for ethanol, you should be able to write this reaction for ethanol. I shouldn't have to write that for you. You should be able to write the elements in their standard states making ethanol is that reaction. That's what that uh, 278 is for. So again, we do this to drive that home. And if you did drive that home, you would say, well, that looks like the elements in their standard state. That looks like ethanol. So that's the formation of ethanol, and I would have arrived there. However, 
doing the math, you would come relatively close if you just broke those bonds, those bonds, and those bonds, and made those bonds, those bonds, those bonds, and those bonds, you would come very close to minus 278. Close enough to distinguish it between this and this. It would not have been exactly 278. Okay? And now you know why. We can get an exact number for that one, or we could estimate it with these bond entities. Okay? I said that enough times that it's uh, obvious now. Okay, if I could go back uh, up top to the uh, presentation. Oh, we got to do this one. This one's important this time, right? Because uh, you have to be in the room. So uh, I hope everybody can see this. It should be locked. No, it's unlocked. Now it's locked. So does everybody see that locked on their screens? Yes? Okay, I'm going to turn the mic off. Remind me to turn it back on. Uh, Okay, so we understand that. Uh, butane combustion, we've done this before. I just want to now reinforce, of course, we're going to bring everything together here. Which one of these releases the most energy? We know that already. We've done it many times. This one releases the most energy because it has the most fuel to burn, okay? Two moles of the combustion, they all do the combustion with oxygen. In these two cases, the balloon breaks and the oxygen's in the air. This case, we just put it in the balloon. So we've seen this one goes much faster and it freely explodes because power is energy per unit time. This one goes very fast, so boom, breaks your uh, eardrums. This one goes slowly because it has to find oxygens in the air. So we've got the rate versus, uh, for those two uh, chemical reactions. These release the same amount of energy, but this does it quickly, that does it slowly, but that's just the kinetics versus thermodynamics. The energy difference is the same, even though one might break the windows up there, other one released the same amount of energy just slowly, so it doesn't break the windows. This is just a mild explosion, that's a dramatic explosion. All because of kinetics, not thermodynamics. But I also wanted to just point out, where is that boom, where is that enthalpy coming from? Where is that release of energy coming from? And now you have a better idea. This side of the reaction isn't very important for the energy release, is it? It's these bonds being formed that are releasing all that energy. It's actually the bond formation that's releasing the energy. So you've come to another step in your understanding of the universe. You're burning butane or you're burning fuel in your car to make your car go. It's that burning process, the breaking of the bonds, is not helping you make the car go. It's the formation of the carbon dioxide and water that are going out the exhaust that's making the car go. Okay? Forming bonds releases energy, making bond, or breaking bonds requires energy. So it's just a new perspective on the same theme uh, that we've seen before. 
And that's just the basic thermodynamics of the question. OK, so I just want to go back. Uh, I want to relate, now that we have talked a little bit more about bond enthalpy, bond energies, I just want to go back because we're, we're a little more sophisticated and talk about intermolecular forces one more time. Because remember, the first time we talked about intermolecular forces, we didn't say you had to identify them or know where they came from. But now we have some quantum mechanics and some other things. So let's look just briefly at where they, the intermolecular forces come from. Uh, so I'll just briefly remind you, this is uh, uh, stuff we all understand, that there's an attraction. There it is, another potential well. Uh, thank goodness uh, everybody did so well on this one on the exam, where you said, what are examples of potential wells? And everybody clicked off uh, all the examples of potential wells on the exam. So this is one of them, the intermolecular forces, atoms coming closer together, or molecules coming closer together, and their attractive forces can hold them in that potential well if their kinetic energy is lower than that energy. I can get trapped in that well, and in this case, we call that condensation. I get trapped close to something, and I make a condensed phase rather than the gas phase. And we've talked about this, so I'm just going to go through it very quickly. That energy is, we know, if you take nothing else home from Chem 1, the energy of a gas is exactly related to its temperature. Kinetic energy is 3 halves uh, RT if it's a whole mole or an individual particle, Boltzmann constant times T. And we know there is a certain proportion of molecules that have more than that energy and a certain proportion that have less than that energy. And that varies with temperature. So as the uh, sample cools off, I get more molecules with less than this energy, and they get more get trapped in that well. OK? So that's our picture of condensation that we've had uh, since uh, uh, early in the class. You can see a lower temperature here. Look at all these particles that have less energy. And all of these particles now are susceptible to being trapped in that well. So there is the condensation as a function of temperature uh, dramatically in the population and the kinetic energy and the potential well, all on one uh, slide. So you should understand all of that quite well so far. That's just review, and then this is also review as well. Uh, the arrows are their kinetic energy. They have a lot of kinetic energy, and it's greater than the attraction energy. So the yellow arrows are their kinetic energy. The uh, interaction energy is the green arrows. That's small. And if those things become about the same, these guys get trapped in the potential well. Of course, for ideal gases up top, this intermolecular force does not exist, so they never condense. That's a property of ideal gases. So only real gases do this. Uh, so let's just uh, look at some examples. So you know this affects the boiling point. So the stronger the intermolecular force, the higher the boiling point. So let's look at some intermolecular forces. Now we know water. We know something about the structure of water. And water and many molecules, all molecules with permanent dipole moments are going to have greater potential to attract each other because they have a legitimate positive and negative end. And the positive ends are going to attract the negative ends. So now we've added this one more level of detail to our understanding of being, we already knew you got trapped in that well because of plus minus interactions, but now we know where they are. We can see the positive end of the water, this water molecule being attracted to the negative end of that water molecule, or any molecule with a permanent dipole moment. So now we can classify. When we get to the exams, if we can identify molecule with a permanent dipole moment, 
we'd say, well, that has stronger potentially intermolecular uh, interactions and it should have a higher boiling point. So I can kind of intuitively classify boiling points a little better than I could before. Boiling points are related to interaction energies, and now I can see where the interaction energies are coming from. Uh, but you have to say, well, what about things that don't have dipole moments? And this is a, um, a transient phenomenon. So if you have two things that are perfectly symmetric, like helium atoms, where do those inter-particle forces come from? They are perfectly symmetric. How would they ever uh, have a plus minus uh, attraction? Well, we call this a transient interaction. The electron cloud is not always symmetric. You know the clouds are, uh, electrons are dynamic. So if you model the electron cloud, you may find very transiently a, a very transient dipole of the electrons uh, being attracted or uh, dispersed around the atom unequally. And that effect gets bigger as you get more and more and more interactions. So lower temperature, that uh, gets bigger because they induce, they encourage each other once one does it, that encourages uh, a dispersion of the electrons on another one, and then they have a little bit of attraction. But it's very weak. And that's why stuff like atomic helium has such a low boiling point, very weak intermolecular, interatomic uh, interactions in that case. So things that are symmetric and small have very low interactions. As they get bigger, as you get electron clouds bigger, this effect does go up. So as the molecule starts to sprawl, even though it might not have a permanent dipole moment, this effect gets bigger. And we know, you know bigger molecules tend to have higher boiling points, and that's uh, a general reason why that is the case. But the bigger you get, the more likely you're going to get all these other things as well. There's one more force that's even, uh, so I've written this little transient dipole here to have them attracted to each other. Uh, there's one that's very important, especially for you going into the biological sciences, probably the most important inter uh, particle interaction in all of biology is what we call hydrogen bonding. And we give it the term bonding, even though it's not an actual covalent bond. But this interaction, when you have dipoles strongly attracted to each other, strong dipoles uh, strongly attracted to each other, especially uh, hydrogen, oxygen, are the most common. Uh, so if you have a very polar bond, you can get very polar bonds involving hydrogen. This is very positive because it's very polar. This is very negative because it's very polar. And that interaction is so strong, it's, uh, it's the dipole-dipole interaction on steroids. So this interaction is, well, it's so strong we, we call it hydrogen bonding. This is one of the major forces that keeps your biological molecules in the conformation that they, they have. So you have dipole-dipole, you have plus-minus things in your huge proteins and nucleic acids. Hydrogen bonding helps stabilize their structure, hold them together in their com complex structures that lead to the functions that they have in the molecule. So incredibly important. Uh, and you may know, it is just uh, coincidentally, you, you probably don't know this, but uh, DNA, when it folds up, it has a major groove and a minor groove. Are you guys familiar with those terms? Uh, water and drugs can line up in those grooves. And that's how some drugs work. And they have to displace the water that's already there. So you can see there'd be a competition between the water and the drug to get in there. Um, uh, one of the things I did in my PhD is I localized the waters in the groove of 
DNA. We were the first to detect that they were even there. It's hard to, it's hard. <laughs> so we had to do some, some crazy spectroscopy to see that the waters were there. But that's important for all uh, biological uh, structures. It's something like 10 kilojoules per mole of these bonds. And that's very, very strong intramolecular interaction. It's still, you saw a lot of bond energies. Bond energies are like 10 times this at least. So regular covalent bonds are still 10 times stronger. But this is so much stronger than these, we give it this special designation. So I can plot some things and we can understand them. Here are some uh, molecules, the boiling point increasing as you get, in this case, more diffuse and you have higher uh, induced interactions. Here's another set of compounds, I'm just going along the periodic table here. I have HCl, HBr, and HI. And in this case, I have the uh, boiling points increasing, mainly because these things, iodine, as you know, is getting very big. HI, that's not as big a dipole, so there's some dipole dipole here and some of this, but it's as if the size is making this interaction is making this trend go. But look at this one. Oops, I don't have it yet. Here, we'll, we'll do these. Here are the, the um, hydrides going along the periodic table again and again, getting larger and more diffuse. But what's that one? Well, if this is H2S, that one's probably H2O. Look at the difference in boiling point between very similar compounds. So very similar in mass, very similar in overall size, but this polarity, the strong polarity of this bond gives this unique interaction that makes that boiling point go crazy high. Same thing here, HF, you know that is a very big electronegativity difference. In fact, you all did very well. That was on the exam, wasn't it? Which is the most ionic or the most polar of those interactions? And you guys all said HF because that's the biggest difference in electronegativity. And here it is again today, displaying that in this crazy high boiling point, becoming uh, hydrogen bonding uh, able to happen in that very large dipole moment. So I love it when everything comes together like that. I'm sure we'll draw some lines through those just to make it dramatic. Uh, tomorrow we'll talk uh, about the entropy of that uh, interaction a little bit. Uh, and uh, we'll do the pop quiz first thing. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we'll, uh, we'll make an adjustment of that, uh, that uh, frequency versus wavelength on the exam as well. All right, see you tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, wear some, if you want, wear some blue and gold. I'll put an announcement out. Wear some blue and gold, and we'll take a group picture right after the pop quiz. And uh, if you'd like, wear some blue and gold to do that. Show your Cal uh, spirit.